So how are we to think about the Hebrew Bible? How are we to think about it as a source of truth, a source of history? Is it, a myth? Is it mythological? Is mythological a problematic thing? Right? We sometimes use myth as if it meant falsehood, but of course, in the field of religious studies, we don't use it that way. Um, so how are we to think about this book? And we'll begin with Professor Wright. Thank you. And uh, am I coming through? Yeah, OK. It's very good to be back here in Memorial Church, where I've been many times before and always enjoyed the welcome. So thank you for the multiple welcome that we've now had. And great place to begin. OK, Bible, Hebrew Bible, what's it about? Um, yes, of course, it is a, a complex and many-sided book. It's rather like at one, there's two images which come to mind. It's, it's like walking into a house where people have lived, the same family has lived for a long time, and the house has many rooms. And in this room, they do one thing. In that room, they do another. There's a dining room, there's a kitchen, there's a bedroom. There's all sorts of different rooms. And you wander through, and you get the sense that, yeah, there are different things that take place in these different rooms, but actually there's a sort of continuity. And you can see portraits on the walls to tell you who, who used to live here. And the people who are now here um, live in a certain way, which is both different and similar to what's gone before. Um, but it's, it's then a house which, uh, from, from the Christian point of view, it's a house in which one finds oneself surprisingly welcome. You know, this is a, uh, a book which has come from a very particular tradition, um, a very sort of sharp-edged tradition over against many other traditions, although there are, of course, confluences with other ideas, but it re retains a sense of family identity. And part of the extraordinary thing that happened in the first century was when people, first century AD, was when people said, actually, you, um, the great unwashed public outside this tradition, Tradition. Now, because of Jesus, you're welcomed into this house. And so Christians sort of wander around this house looking around, my goodness, can I be part of this family? So that's, that's the first image. The second image is of a journey. Um, and you, when you go on a journey, your beginning, your middle, your continuity, your end, uh, they may be significantly different places, but there is a continuity all through. And uh, it seems to me that the way that Jews in the first century read their scriptures, well, they read them in many ways, but one of the ways was to see the first five books, the Torah, the Law of Moses, not just as the backstory, the stuff that happened way back when, but in a sense as the whole story, because the fifth of those books, Deuteronomy, ends with um, a covenant promise that if you do this, it'll be good, and if you do that, it'll be bad, but then even after the bad bit, God will do something new. And there are signs in the first century that they are reading the rest of the, uh, the Bible, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, within that sense of a larger story. It's going somewhere. They're not quite sure where it's going. And that's a story then again, which, though it's a very different journey with lots of twists and turns, becomes the back story and then the ongoing story for the early Christian church as well. That, that's probably enough to set that ball, ball rolling. Excellent. So is this okay? I can hear. People can hear me. I also want to start off by expressing my gratitude to the Veritas uh, group and to the organizers for inviting me to take part in this. I'm very excited about it. Um, I'm extremely conscious of the fact that I'm probably the least qualified of the three of us up here to talk about the Bible. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm not a New Testament scholar or an Old Testament scholar. But I am very interested in the Bible, and so let me just say where I come from, and then I'll try to say something about, about how one finds truth in the Hebrew Bible as I understand it. I'm uh, situated in the current context. I'm interested in the current stage that we're at now in the history of the West, and the particular kinds of problems that each of us as individuals and all of us as a culture face, which I think are peculiar problems, problems that people in previous epochs in the history of the West haven't faced. Uh, pe many people, uh, uh, believers and non-believers alike, call our age a secular age. And I think one of the things that that means is that we face and recognize a certain kind of threat that's very foreign to people in earlier epochs in the history of the West. And it goes under a variety of different names. Uh, some of the philosophers that I'm interested in are people like Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish philosopher. He said it's the leveling of all meaningful differences that we face, the possibility that nothing's going to seem significant to us anymore. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, around the same time, said it's the threat of nihilism 
the threat that we're not going to be able to recognize any significant, meaningful differences in our lives or in the world. Uh, David Foster Wallace, a contemporary American novelist, said he recognizes it as, as a kind of stomach-level sadness that everyone in his generation seems to feel. And I, and I recognize that, and I'm interested in combating it. And one of the places that I think is really interesting to go to to try to combat that is the, is the Bible. And in the context of the Hebrew Bible in particular, one of the things that I'm interested in is that that experience that I think many of us recognize and that we recognize as a part of our culture is just not there. It's a very different kind of experience that they're narrating and that they're expressing. The kind of phenomena that motivate the narrative that gets told in the Old Testament is a phenomenon according to which you as an individual or as a people recognize a kind of care that God has for you a kind of covenant that gets made between you and God that obliges you to recognize the world as a place that you've got stewardship over, as a significant and meaningful place that it's your obligation or your duty to take care of and to, to take care of yourself by cultivating in yourself the ability to, to do that kind of stewardship work. That's a very different understanding of who a people are and of what the world is, and I'm attracted to it. I think if one had that understanding, if one lived in a world where that was the way you understood yourself, then the threat that many people write about as the threat of nihilism or the threat of leveling, uh, it would be a threat that we would be able to combat. So I'm interested in finding a kind of truth in the Hebrew Bible where that, uh, that reflects something that I can recognize as an understanding of the self and an understanding of the world where it's the world is something that you are obligated to care about, that it's appropriate for you to care about, and that there's something in the world that draws you to it and that cares about you. That seems to me amazingly compelling, and that's what draws me to that part of the Bible. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.